So the next talk here is from Joachim Rocha from Gallia. He's from Portugal and he will talk, uh, he has worked on some applications like the BluePad or Java, Java 2 mobile uh, application for PC remote controls. He has ported the uh, Eye of Gnome tool to Maemo. He did an app for tracking TV shows on the Maemo 5. And as his master thesis, he wrote some tool called OZR Feeder, which uh, converts printed documents into an open document format. So, and now he's talking about um, a skeleton tracking framework. Um, this was made because uh, the Xbox device, the Kinetics device from Microsoft, was the first camera on the market which was cheap to get and provided you uh, dev information. Um, but there were only closed frameworks for more complex work uh, with this information. And like skeleton tracking and so on. And so he developed a library called Skeldrack or a framework. And now he talks about this library. Warm welcome to Joachim. Uh, can you get me a water? Uh, yeah, I try to get warm. Okay. <coughs> hey guys. Um, so uh, I was already introduced. Uh, I'm Joachim. So uh, I work at Igalia. It's a company in Spain. It's based in Spain, but it's joining hackers uh, around the world. Um, um, it's, a, it's just a, well, it's a free software consultancy, a company, if you want to check it out. Anyway, so uh, just like I said, I worked uh, on OCR Feeder uh, and also a program called Series Analogy Track Series because I like doing innovative stuff, something that just, you know, tackles a, a need, a problem, uh, like I think we all uh, like to do. Um, last year I was here introducing uh, OCR feeder and I really liked the feedback that I, that I had from uh, German folks. Uh, and today I'm going to present this uh, skull track thing. <coughs> so um, first let's talk a, a bit about the Kinect. <coughs> <coughs> so the Kinect was the first uh, camera with a, a price affordable to, to the public. Uh, the first depth camera that that is that people could afford because it, it's just over a hundred euros and almost every developer can afford that to hack. Um, <coughs> so one thing is that uh, one good thing is that Microsoft they said they said it was all on uh, all on purpose, but uh, the 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 USB connection of of the Kinect is open. So you can get the signal and you can do stuff uh, using lib, uh, lib USB with it. So I, th I think I heard that in the beginning they didn't like really uh, that people hacked the Kinect, but then they saw the tremendous success that it had and they said, oh, we left it just like that on purpose. So I don't know which, which story to believe, but anyway. So uh, because of the connection being open, it originated uh, open source projects like the, the LibFreeNet, uh, which allows you to control the Kinect uh, using, you know, this uh, uh, independent library, not from Microsoft, uh, and you can use it on Windows, on Mac OS, and on, on Linux. So uh, in Igalia, we do a lot of work in, in GNOME, and we like the, the glib um, library. Thank you. Um, so we developed a wrapper around LibFreeNet to be more friendly with uh, the way that we do stuff in GNOME. By the way, who, who knows Glib or have used it here? Only one person, two, okay, three. Uh, well, <laughs> so we developed this wrapper and it offers some nice stuff like an asynchronous API, which is cool because it won't block your UI when you're trying to connect with the Kinect. <coughs> so yeah. Uh, we also have some synchronous uh, functions because, for example, one of the functions, uh, the, one of the things that you can do with the Kinect is that it has a, a tilt, it's called a tilt, which is uh, a little engine that makes it go up and down when you put it on top of your TV or whatever. 
Uh, so we have an, an, an asynchronous function for that. So you just say, okay, put me the, the tilt at zero degrees, and if it's on 30 degrees, which is the maximum, uh, uh, it, you, you do not have to wait because it's asynchronous, so it will uh, do it something like and then you will have a callback when it finishes. But sometimes you don't, need, you don't want to do that. If you have a common line application, for example, you just want to wait until it's on zero, so we offer some synchronous uh, functions as well. <coughs> One good reason to use uh, glib is that it, it, it offers you g-object introspection. So g-object is like the base for every object, of, for every object in, the, in, in glib. Uh, so it, it, glib kind of offers uh, object orientation on C. Um, and the g-object introspection, I don't know if you know about it, but it's really interesting because before you needed to, to do a binding for every library that was written in, in glib. And right now with g-object introspection, you just need to do the bindings uh, for the languages you want, but, but uh, you do the bindings for a, a glue code that will load other libraries by itself. So in the case of Python, you got the PyG object, and that's, that's the, the piece that people need to do the bindings by hand, but once that is done, and it's done, you can load uh, libraries dynamically on C. So this is like free bindings. And you can use it on Python, on JavaScript, and on Vala. Vala is kind of a C-sharp uh, language for GNOME. So some people think that the Kinect is a stereoscopic camera. Uh, stereoscopic would be like, like we humans do. We have two eyes, and our brain just uh, do the calculations and says, okay, so I'm looking at this microphone, and it should be around this distance, because I'm used to, to things being this distance, and I can compare all inside my brain. So the Kinect does, does not do this. The Kinect, what it does is that you see the the, the circle on the left, uh, on the far most left, uh, that's, that emits a, an IR pattern, a light pattern. Uh, so the light then reaches you or whoever is in front of, of the camera. And the rightmost circle, it's a, a, an infrared camera. So that captures it and the Kinect just sees the distortions in the, in the, in the image. And from that it can calculate uh, the depth. Uh, the circle in the, in, the, in the middle is a regular RGB camera. So people usually think that two of those cameras are the stereoscopic thing, but it's not like that. And this technique is called uh, um, structured light camera. Okay. But anyway, that information that it does uh, is just raw values from zero to, to 2048. That's 11... Uh, bytes. Uh, so I'm telling you this because people usually think that the Kinect already gives you the skeleton thing. My brother used to, to attend computer science. He's now moved to, to being a to be a, a male nurse. <laughs> uh, but he he told uh, he watched my the video I did for for Skeltrack, and I asked him so. Uh, do, do you think it's cool? And he said, "Oh, it's pretty cool. What camera did you use?" I, I said, "I used the Kinect." And he said. Uh, so, what did you really do? Because the Kinect always does that. The Kinect does not do what I'm going to show you. The Kinect just gives you information about what's closer or what's for, uh, further. And the libfreenect, and of course the the wrapper we did, the gfreenect gives though can give those values uh, in millimeters. So this is what you you usually capture using the the gfreenect. That that's me, by the way. Uh, so uh, it's kind of difficult to see because it's in grayscale, but what I did was to, to put a, a threshold uh, so it, it didn't capture the walls and the chairs and everything that was in the office beside, uh, behind me, but it just captured uh, like a, a, a threshold. Uh, and it's difficult to see, but uh, that upper hand, it's closer to the camera, it's like this, than this one. So it should be, it should be darker. But it, uh, I think you cannot really perceive that from that. <coughs> anyway, this, what you s just saw, does not, does not tell you that, that there is a person in the, in the picture. Uh, it, it also does not tell you it's a cow 
or even the Impelman, let alone a skeleton and where the joints are. Because for that you need uh, another piece of software on top of this, uh, which is called a skeleton tracking solution. So, as always, you have proprietary stuff to do that. So let's do a bit of commercial work for Microsoft. And you got the, the Microsoft Connect SDK, which is uh, for non-commercial work only. So that is, if you want to develop business uh, using this, this SDK, uh, you cannot. You can just do it for your uh, independent or student stuff, because you know, if you, if you want to do money, if you want to create value with it, uh, Microsoft wants a piece of that. Then you got the, the open knee or open NI or whatever. So this one is more open as in, in the sense of they, they have parts of the, uh, this is like a framework and they have parts that, that, that are open uh, and it's commercial compatible. The problem is that uh, it, it's got some binary blobs uh, that you need to install and you need to accept a, a, an EULA license uh, to use the skeleton tracking part. So, yeah, not, not enough for, for, for me. And recently, Microsoft uh, released what they call the Connect for Windows, which is a commercial, uh, it allows commercial uh, usage of it, uh, but it's incompatible, uh, I don't know if it's incompatible uh, uh, in the technical uh, way or just in the legal way, uh, but it's incompatible with the Xbox Connect. So what it means is that you need to go to Microsoft or to, or to their providers and buy a Kinect that is a little bit more expensive than the regular one. And, and here's the share that you need to, to give to Microsoft because you're going to do uh, commercial work with it. <coughs> Sorry. And of course, uh, Microsoft does not really care about us uh, who use Linux and other um, stuff. So it's only for Windows and that's unacceptable. So the conclusion is there are no free or there were no free solutions to perform skeleton tracking. So we decided to build one. I think this is the way that open source works and should work is that you see something that you are not satisfied with and you should try to, to put your, your skills to work into it even though uh, it's not really as, as easy as sometimes it sounds. <laughs> so what we wanted was uh, a shared library. By the way, uh, as, I, as I said, it's called Skeltrack. Uh, and we wanted a shared library. Uh, no face SDK, it's not even a, a framework uh, like it was introduced, but no problem. Uh, we wanted it to be device independent. So I gave you all this lecture about the Connect for a reason, which is uh, if, you, if you are gonna hack on something uh, with a depth camera, it's, it's likely that you are going to buy a Kinect uh, unless you have more money to spend on another. But we wanted to make it device independent. Not like the other solutions I told you about, which expect you to connect the, uh, a device to it. We, we expect uh, non-device to be connected. Um, so we also didn't want pattern matching or databases because that, 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 that's another complexity to the whole thing and of course we wanted it to be easy to use because everybody wants that and this of course is not really straightforward so I was researching about it and uh, I found this paper by a German uh, researcher called Andreas Bach uh, and it, it's got this very descriptive name um, so we based our work on it on not completely, of course, uh, because this paper uses a database of poses. So they, they capture, we do more or less what they do that I'm going to explain, but they, once they know where your uh, in points of interest are, they match, it, uh, they match them with uh, a database and they say, okay, so this guy looks to be like this or this guy looks to be like this. Um, that's pretty good, but I don't know uh, how it goes when, when you need real time. So, so how does Skeltrack really works? Uh, first we need to find the extremus. The extremus is like 
if you imagine a starfish, a starfish is like, is like this, right? Uh, a starfish, uh, the extremes of, of the starfish is like this and this and this. So it's the, it's the points, you can say that it's a, are the points are far away, uh, further away from the, from the center. So uh, to, to get the extremes, we first need to make a graph uh, uh, whose nodes are the depth pixels. So we take the depth buffer that the libfreenact or another library gave you from a, a, a 3D camera, uh, and you make a node of it. Uh, the way to, to uh, make a graph, that is, uh, of it. The way to, to make the graph is that the nodes or the vertices um, should be connected to, to each other if, the, if they're neighbors, and I, and I look for eight neighbors, uh, if they are less than a, a given value. If they are too far away, like this point is too far away from this point, I do not connect them. But I connect this point with this point with this point, and so it goes. So another thing is that the connect, I don't know if you, if you tried it uh, with a libfreenect, but it, it produces a lot of noise. So you, 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 I don't know if you saw on YouTube or something uh, that you see the, the, the depth uh, map, and it's always like flickering. And that's because of the, of the light stuff that I told you about. And also the, there is another uh, thing to, to consider, which is when you, when you, for example, you are like this, you have an arm here, uh, there is uh, an area uh, below your arm that is completely black. And by black I mean that the Kinect doesn't know what, what's there. Uh, and that happens because you're creating kind of a shadow to, to this part. Because you know the light comes from one place and the, ca the camera captures it from uh, a slightly different uh, place uh, and it produces shadows. So this means that we sometimes end up with uh, two components of a graph, and that's not good. So we need to connect the components. So if I'm like this, I have a component which goes from my arm up, and another component that goes from my arm down. And the same happens when you are like this, you can have a component just for your hand. So you need to connect them. So the way to connect them, that is from the, from the paper from Buck, uh, is to get the closest points to the, to the component that has uh, the, the greatest number of, of nodes. So if the greatest number of nodes is my torso, and I'm like this, and this is a different component, I connect the closest points of this component together with this component. So I just draw an edge from a point here to, to here. Anyway, don't worry about the math. So, um, yeah. So then we need to, to choose a starting point and to use the Dextra's uh, algorithm. Dextra's algorithm, as you might have studied uh, in computer science, if that's your background, is, uh, is an algorithm to, to calculate the, shorted, the shortest path between two nodes in a graph. So we need to calculate this from a starting point to every other node. Um, and then we choose the furthest point. And that means that you get an extrema. So what it means is that if my starting point is this one, uh, and I'm like this, I choose the, the, the point that is further away, and it of course will find my leg, uh, in this case, or it, if you are seeing just from my waistline up, it might find my arm, because, because it's the one that is further away. Okay, so once we find those extremas, what we need to do is to connect them with the point uh, where we started from, uh, and we connect them with a zero cost edge. What it means is that, uh, well, what, what it means is that the next time you calculate dextra, uh, dextra from, from the starting point, uh, you will no longer get the same extrema because you already have a path to that extrema that costs zero, so you, you'll be like that in there. So this means that you will not have repeated uh, extremas, okay? Uh, once, you, once you have that, you also change the, the starting point. You say that the starting point is now the, the extrema that you just found. And this means that if my starting point was this, and the first extrema was this, and I am like this, the, the second extrema will be this, because it's further away from both points. And you can do this n times to find n extremas. So the first difference uh, from what we did to, to, to Buck's paper 
is when choosing the, the, the starting point. Box paper, uh, a box chooses a, a, a starting point that is a, a centroid point. The way to do this, uh, you can do it in many ways, but one way of doing this is to get uh, an arithmetic average of all the points, uh, and, you, and then uh, you, get, you, get your, you get your centroid. But what it means is that if you are like this, you get a centroid that is, if you are calculating from the whole body, get a centroid that, is, that should be like this. But if you are like this, your centroid will go up. So we first wanted to, to focus on the upper body. So this means that if I am like this and I get the starting point here and I start calculating extremes, it's okay. But if I do this, uh, my centroid point will go up and this means that points below will be farther away and that I will, and that I will have more trouble to find the upper body part, which is the one I'm interested at, in. So what we do is that we calculate uh, the centroid point and then we choose the, the point that is lowest vertically uh, but horizontally aligned to the starting point. That is, if I am like this and I'm uh, recording uh, the whole of me, uh, I get the central point, uh, the, the centroid point, and then I calculate the one that is below uh, until I don't have data. So it would be my fit. If you are calculating from my belly up, it would be around here. And this is good, uh, because this assures that uh, you will always get the extremus up in your upper body. I don't know if you are understanding anything, but we can talk later. Uh, so, so when you, so you do all this and you got the extremus. So what to do with them? Because, okay, you know that there is a point in there that might be a head, that might be a hand, uh, that might be a shoulder. You, you don't really know. So you need to interpret them. And the way we do this, unlike Bach, who uses a database, uh, we use uh, heuristics in this case. So these are just educated guesses that work for most of the cases, we hope. So anyway, rewinding a bit, we, we'll, we do the, the algorithm to get the extremus uh, for three extremus. Why three extremus? Because we are focusing on the upper body, and the upper body has three extremus, the head and the, in both hands. Um, so the next step to identify them is to, is to check each of them and to hope that they are the head. Uh, the way we do this is that we go through each extrema and we look for the points where the shoulders should be. Uh, this means that if the, if the first extrema is this hand and my hand is like this, for example, I go here and I say, okay, so the, the shoulders should be around here, here and here, and you do not have data in there. Uh, by the way, the, the values of these two imaginary shoulder points uh, are configurable. Uh, so you do this here, it will fail. You do this here, it will fail. You do it to the head and you get the shoulders. Of course, that sometimes, if you are like this, you might get one shoulder here and one shoulder here. We are trying to tackle that one. So if they obey these rules, you get the head and shoulders. So about the, the remaining two extremists, you also need to do some work because they might be hands or they might, might be elbows. Why is that? Because sometimes you are like this and of course, if you are calculating from your starting point here, it will not give you the hand. It will give you something uh, farther away. But we saw that, for example, uh, uh, a usual case is that when you are like this and the, the farthest point are the elbows. So to calculate, uh, to, to see, to see if, if they are hands or elbows, we calculate the extra from the, the remaining extremus to the shoulder points. Uh, so uh, in this first step, uh, for example, I calculate from here to here and I get a distance and I also calculate from here to here and to here. This means that uh, I do this for both shoulders and not, and not just the shoulder that is horizontally aligned with, with the extremus because if you are like this, it will say that this is my left hand when it's not. And by doing the extra to the shoulders, uh, you, will, you will get that fixed. Um, so about the hand and the, and the elbow that I was explaining, once you know that, that an extrema is the left one and the right one, what, what we do is that we check if the distance to the shoulder is less than a, than a defined value, which can be changed as well. 
according to your needs. So if it's less than a value, for example, if, or if it's farther than, than a value, like if it's farther than this, for example, I say, okay, so I got a point here and it's, it's greater than this distance, so it's not an elbow, it's a hand. But if I am like this and I get the extrema here, uh, it will be a, an elbow. Still, if you find uh, a hand, we still need the elbow. So what we do is that we use the, the path that we calculated before from the extrema to the shoulder, and we check the, the point that is uh, close to that, to that uh, elbow distance. So it, it will always give you a point that is really close to the elbow, this way. And you got yourself uh, skeleton tracking with this. So, but there are some, uh, some things missing, so this will be the, f the future work. Uh, of course, if you get the elbows, I still do not find the ends uh, this way. So I need to do something for when you are like this, I need to check, uh, probably abusing Dextra's algorithm again, to check uh, where the hand is. Uh, and the problem with this is, is that I need to check that it's uh, this way and not this way, for example. Also smoothing. So because of the noise and all the things, uh, you, you also you, you get a lot of, of jittering in the in the in the extremis. Uh, this also happens with, in OpenE uh, and and also Microsoft SDK and all of that, and they have values to tweak this to just make it a little better. So I need to do this as, that as well. Um, robustness. We need some restrictions because we right now. If you have a chair next to you, it might be considered part of your body. So we need to do something to exclude some elements. And multi-user, uh, because right now we track one person, it will be fairly simple to uh, track more than one person. And of course, get the rest of the, of the extremis, of the joints, sorry, the, the knees and the feet and all of that. Uh, so how to use this? Uh, you got the asynchronous API. Uh, that we did for, for this. So you, uh, how many people know C here? Okay, quite some. Okay, so we just initialize a skeleton uh, instance, right, on the first line, and then we call the, the asynchronous method track joints. Uh, we give them the skeleton, we give them the depth buffer. As you see, there is no connect involved here. You have to give, of course, the width and the height of the, of the buffer. Uh, the first null argument, it's a uh, uh, g-cancellable. Uh, it's part of, of, G of glib's API for asynchronous functions. So uh, I have a null in there, it means that I do not have a, uh, a cancellable function that I will call to cancel, to cancel this, uh, this processing. And of course I give them uh, my callback, uh, that is the on-track joints, which will be called once the, the joints are tracked. Uh, the remaining argument is null because I do not want to, to assign any errors, any error variable. So you define your callback on track joints. It has, of course, some, some predefined uh, arguments. Then we initialize some joints and we, and we just uh, declare a list. And the way to get the list of joints is by doing a skeleton uh, track joints finish. Uh, and it will get you a list that might be empty or not, uh, if you have a person or not in the in the in front of the connect. And then if you if you want the head, for example, you just need to to do this to the list. List get joint, and you pass it the the head ID. And the same for other extremes. So we also have a synchronous API, which with just this call you can do skeleton tracking. This is good for offline processing. There is a Greek company uh, that, is do, that is using the synchronous API. So uh, a skeleton joint currently has these uh, many uh, uh, variables. It has an ID to identify if it's a head, uh, a left elbow, right elbow. It has an X and Y coordinate in the real world in millimeters. Uh, and it has a, a screen X and screen Y uh, coordinates, which is in pixels because you might want your your values in pixels to draw something on screen. So if you want to, to submit patches or, or open issues, you got the GitHub, 
in there. Uh, you also, if you want to develop with it, you can get the Jeffrey Neck, like I said, and uh, I developed also something called Jeffrey Neck Utils, uh, which is cool for, for developing. Uh, so this is the Jeffrey Neck Python example. It's written in Python, and you can control the Kinect using uh, this. It's part of Jeffrey Neck. This is one of the nifty tools uh, uh, that is part of, of Jeffrey Neck Utils, and it's a record depth file. Uh, well, actually, uh, it's, it's, I, I must take it. So this is the depth file viewer. You just pass them a, a depth file, and you can also give them uh, coordinates to, to be put in there. So th this is cool because you can use the uh, scale track, get the coordinates, and just check where they are without rendering it on real time. And this is the record file, <laughs> file uh, depth file. This is a colleague of mine, the one that developed Jeffrey Neck. And you just launch this, and you see how it, uh, how you look in there, and you press space to take a, a shot of you. So it will record a depth file that you can view with this. And that's it. We got no more time. So, questions? So, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this interesting talk and this interesting work uh, on this closed device. So, any questions? No questions at all? Is that possible? Oh, by the way, I've got, I've got two Egalia marks for, for the best question, so you might as well do one. <laughs> um, so your work is related to a very simple body model. And for example, if you want, want to uh, take a picture of your cat or your dog, uh, this will not fit. Of or course not. Uh, by skeleton tracking, I mean human skeleton tracking. So, and w <laughs> what happens if you have a tool like a stick or, or something for for a basic game? Uh, is it possible to to uh, distinguish the stick from an elbow? Uh, no, 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 not really, because you know uh, we're just aiming for people to do the stuff that they usually do with the Kinect, or uh, and I'm not even talking about gaming only. You might, for example have an architecture firm, you want to show uh, models, uh, 3D models to, to, to your clients, and you can use a Kinect, use Scaltrack, and you just rotate them like this, or whatever you can. Oh, I got, I got some videos to show you. I, I don't know if, if there is time or not, but it's one minute. Yes, you can show it. Okay, okay, so, yeah, I almost forgot. So let's see. Um, How much time do we got? We have oh, for me, so that's okay. more than enough. So this is the Connect test that comes with the library. And as you see, this is real time. I swear to you, this is not uh, <laughs> post-processing. I do not usually only wear this T-shirt, but uh, it's just coincidence. Uh, so as you, as you see my hands in there on the left, uh, the circles kind of uh, are, are bigger when, you, when, when they are closer to the, to the camera. Can I, what's going on? Yeah, so, so you can see that, that the circles are slightly uh, smaller uh, when they are far away or and, and bigger when they are closer, right? So this is kind of interesting, but what people really liked, and that's the reason this went, disappeared on Ars Technica and PC World and Slashdot and whatever, uh, is this video. How many people saw this already? Nobody? All right. So this is the GNOME uh, desktop, and I just did a, sp a small piece of code on top of Skeltrack to, to control Xlib. I connected to GNOME 3, and you got a desktop like uh, Minority Report and stuff. This is also real time. You can see the Connect here in the right, and this is just a regular TV that we have in our office. This is 
Uh, no, the, the the code the code uses xlib, but just just because I had to to use something to feed GNOME with the events. So it's it's really simulating a mouse, right? And you can, uh, when I do pinch, I just simulate the uh, mouse wheel up, uh, oh. control mouse wheel up. You can uh, do questions if you want. Uh, actually, do you have a plan to recognize if the person is looking at you or looking at away, away from you? Sorry? If you have the skeleton, you have no information if the person is looking at you, at the camera, or if it's looking in a way. It's, for th it's, it's about the same. If I'm looking towards the camera or away? No, no, because, because we do not track the face. That's actually right. one of the things I, I need to consider. Like when I get the extremists, probably it's a, it's a good way of, of making it more robust just to use OpenCV around the extremist area and to do face detection. So of course a, a, a hand will not, will not be positive when you are looking for a face. Uh, in this way we could be always certain that, that it's, a, it's a face uh, when we're looking for it. Yeah, so you, you can also play games in Linux using this. Cool. Right. Are there any more questions? Okay. Actually, you say real time. How small can the hardware be to have the information real time? Uh, actually, a little ARM box with three, four hundred megahertz will it really be able to give. You're talking you about the minimal specs. Yeah. Uh, I don't really know. This is okay. running on my laptop. Uh, this one. <laughs> So uh, I really don't know. It's, okay. it's a matter of, of trying it out. Uh, anyway, we, we, I did this, uh, of course, because there were no solutions, but because we have a small team in Igali that is trying to, trying to get uh, into interactive uh, installations uh, using free software. Uh, so we will try to run this on minimal hardware. It's not, it's not going to run on, I don't know, Arduino, I assume, but, <laughs> but yeah. Any more questions? The f uh, I can tell you also that the funniest case, uh, I received a lot of emails because of this, and the funniest case that somebody asked me about was that uh, it's a researcher in um, Costa Rica, I think. He said that uh, he's tracking monkeys in a, in a zoo or a forest, or I don't know. Uh, so he tried to use OpenE and it, it didn't work because they are slightly different than us. Uh, he tried to contact the OpenE guys, no answer. He tried to use Microsoft, uh, he couldn't. Uh, he tried to contact Microsoft, forget about it. So he's trying to use this to track monkeys, <laughs> which is something I didn't imagine. Okay, so thank you for this interesting to tool and this interesting work and the talk here. Um, uh, applause, please, for Jaska. The next